So last talk of the session is about white box implementation, how to attack them to recover the affine encoding. And the talk will be given by Baptiste Lamba. Yeah. So, hello everyone. So yeah, uh, I will talk about how to recover affine encodings in white body implementations. And this is a joint work with uh, Patrick Derbez, Pierre-Alain Fouque, and uh, Brice Mino. So, I will first start with a quick introduction to give a bit of context. Uh, then I will present our generic algorithm and do a quick part about the dedicated attack we mounted on a specific white box scheme. So, first, what is uh, the model? So, classically, when we study a block cipher, we are in the black box model. So, for example, you have this box, which you know does some AES with a fixed key K, and the attacker wants to try to recover this key, and he can only use inputs and outputs of the algo uh, algorithm, basically. So this is a classical model, and it evolves uh, recently in the gray box model, where, well, the hypotheses are the same, except that now you have also access to some leakage uh, when the computation is done, so such like uh, electromagnetics, uh, power, or whatever. And if you go a bit further, then you get white box. So white box is like the ultimate gray box. Uh, you have just access to the implementation of uh, this box. You know exactly how it's implemented. And you could do whatever you want with it. You can set breakpoints, you can uh, skip an instruction, you can even modify the implementation if it can help you to extract the key. And obviously, you can read the implementation. So if the key is like just plain text written, it's useless. So the goal of white box uh, cryptography is to try to provide uh, an implementation which is secure uh, against such attacks. So the attacker has two, has two goals. Either he wants to just extract some key material, so this is like the best, uh, the best way to attack it. But you can also just want to compute uh, the inverse of the function. So for example, if you're given a white box implementation of an encryption, you want to uh, get uh, the decryption scheme while you're not allowed to get it. And so the main application of this is probably uh, digital rights management, uh, because you need to do some decryption on the um, client side. And you can also think of it as some form of uh, post quantum public key encryption, uh, where your implementation is your public key, but that's like more uh, funny stuff. So, yeah. Um, there were quite a lot of proposals for white box. So, the first one was proposed by Cho et al. in 2002, was broken quickly afterwards. And after that, several well, designs came up. Mainly, we have two strategies, table lookup and uh, SSL-like. So, as you can see, basically, everything is broken. Uh, <laughs> it's a well-known fact for white box. Uh, a few things still uh, stand. So we have the proposal by Biyukov et al. at TOSC uh, 17, uh, which is just using a lot of uh, SSR layers. Um, it tends to go up quickly in terms of uh, the size of the implementation, so it's a bit hard to use. We also have a uh, white block from uh, Fouk et al. Uh, it's it's proven secured, but the model is a bit odd, and it's not exactly uh, what I described uh, just before, so it's kind of an oddball here. And otherwise, basically, all the main proposals were broken, and the only, ones, uh, the only one that lasted uh, was the one from Baek et al. Uh, two years ago, and this is on this scheme we mounted a dedicated, a dedicated attack. So. I will focus on table lookup, and basically most uh, table lookup construction are based on the framework from show. 
So the idea is to obfuscate a block cipher, and to do so, well, your block cipher can be decomposed in some round function, and you will just obfuscate each of those round, uh, those, uh, round function independently in such a way that once you put them uh, all together, the um, obfuscation will just cancel and you still have your block cipher. And to obfuscate such uh, this round function, um, you will so generate some uh, encodings, so the FR in the slide, and implement your obfuscated ROM function with uh, some uh, tables. So just plain uh, table. And so to evaluate your block, your block cipher, it's just some table lookup, um, a chain of table lookup. And yeah, uh, to increase a bit of security, so you, want, you don't want the attacker to have access to zero plain text or uh, of zero uh, cipher text, so you add some uh, external encodings so uh, around the block cipher. Now the thing is, um, you can just pick the encodings at random. Uh, if you do that, the implementation will be way too huge. So you need to uh, get give a bit of structure of structure on the, uh, those encodings. So basically, you split them in two parts, the affine and the uh, nonlinear part of uh, the encoding. And you need to do this yeah, to get uh, efficient implementation. But the thing is, the nonlinear non part can be recovered uh, very efficiently from an algorithm by Baik et al. And so most of the time, the hard part is to recover the affine uh, part of your encodings. And if you think about this problem in a very uh, generic way, uh, it was actually solved uh, by Bioka et al. in 2003. So you can see this problem as uh, described here. So you have two bijections, this one and N2. And you want to find some affine mappings A and B such that uh, S2 is equal to B times uh, S1 times A. Yeah, if they exist. And so in our case, uh, S2 will be our obfuscated one function, and S1 will be the original one function. So uh, this algorithm is uh, well known. Uh, it works <laughs> very well. Uh, but the complexity is basically exponential uh, in the size of the function. And even uh, with the uh, improvement by Dinu uh, last year, um, it's exponential in the size of the function. So if you think um, on to apply this on block ciphers, it's basically exponential if the block size. So even like 64 bits is way too huge to break in practice. And well, this is uh, the, the problem we wanted to, to break, but it turns out that when applied to whiteboard crypto on some block ciphers, we don't, um, we don't have a generic instance of uh, the algorithm. We have an instance which looks like this. So if you want to obfuscate a block cipher uh, like a yes, you will have uh, in the middle of your one function a layer of uh, S boxes. And so our middle layer, uh, which was S1 in the pre pre previous slide, uh, it just just not some random nonlinear part. It's really uh, a concatenation of some S box. So there is already a bit of structure, uh, structure in our problem. And so to resume, the problem is the following. So you are given the uh, encoded one function f. Uh, so you know it. You know it's built as b times this layer of S box times a, uh, b and a being uh, affine and secret, and you want either to uh, find a way to invert this function, so in the context of whiteboard crypto, this leads to a decryption function, or even try to find exactly which A and B were used, and this uh, can lead to a key recovery. So in our case, our generic algorithm uh, solves the first point, so given such a function, we can efficiently get uh, its inverse. So, uh, we'll 
uh, get, uh, give uh, how it works. So basically, it's a two-step algorithm. First, you isolate the input uh, or subspace of each S-box. And it's actually a technique which was known since 2001 uh, by Biokov and Shamir when they cryptanalyzed uh, CISAS. And once you did that, you just need to apply the generic affine equivalence algorithm I spoke about earlier. But this one not on the whole block suffer, but on each S-box, which are a lot smaller. So to get the input space of each S-box, the first step is to find such a space for V1. So this space is a linear space, uh, yeah, a linear uh, space of differences. And you want that the image, uh, the image of the space through A um, leads to um, M0 bits, uh, M0 consecutive bits. So basically, the, di so the difference at the input of one S box is zero. So the, uh, the value is constant. And otherwise, it takes all the possible values. So this leads to a space of dimension n minus m after a. So since a must be invertible, uh, v1 must be of dimension n minus m2. But now, um, all these boxes are bijective. So if the input is constant, well, the output is, uh, is two. And if the rest takes all possible values, right, so does the output. And again, this goes through B, and B is invertible. So the resulting space U1 is also of dimension n minus m. So we will use this to build V1. So we want to build first uh, such a space V1. And to do this, we just need to use a very simple test. Uh, if we want to test if a difference belongs to V1, we just generate a bunch of uh, random vectors, uh, big enough, so basically a bit more than n minus m. And we compute the resulting output difference space, so the difference between uh, the, image, the image of each vector through f and the uh, image uh, of x plus delta. And we compute the dimension of uh, the Liliana space generated by this uh, space u. And if it's of dimension n minus m, then as shown here, um, the resulting space would be of the same uh, dimension. So we guess that uh, delta will belong to V1 with high probability, and we can basically um, adjust this probability uh, as high as we want. And so we just need to do this with some independent vectors to build the basis of V1, and just making sure that the output different space is always the same. And well, we, do the, we did this for V1, which uh, led to zero on one uh, S box uh, S1, but we can do this k times to get a space uh, a space which uh, have a zero difference in each S box. And once you have all those k space, well, you can uh, just take the attention section of all of them except one. And basically, this will put a zero difference in all S boxes except, well, for example, the first one. And so the resulting input space will be of dimension m, because, again, everything here is invertible. And the output space, O1, will be of dimension m, too. So you now have uh, a mapping from an m-dimensional linear space to another m-dimensional uh, linear space. So you can compute some projection pi and qi to uh, send f2 to the m to the input space and to send the output space to f to the m. But now, what you have is basically uh, a map on m bits, which is affine equivalent to one of the S-box. And so now, you can apply the affine equivalence algorithm, because it will only be exponential in the size of the S-box, so basically 8 most of the time. And this will give you some uh, affine map mappings, uh, AI, AI and BI. And so you do this for each S box. So you will get a bunch of AI, PI, BI, QI. So you know all of them. And you just um, put them together correctly. And this will give you 
two affin, uh, affin mappings, uh, B prime and A prime. And you can now write F, so our encoded word function, as B prime times the layer of S box times A prime. Now, you know B prime, you know A prime, they are affine, so is it invert? And you know all the S boxes, and they're small, they're bijectives, you can compute the inverse to. So now you can in easily uh, compute an inverse of the encoded work function f as uh, this expression. So for each uh, encoded one function, we can actually compute its inverse, so we can compute the whole uh, decryption algorithm. So in terms of complexity, um, yeah, to compare a bit uh, with what were made before, you can see that I don't have that much time. Uh, basically, everything before was exponential, so uh, the complexity of the Bayekatar algorithm uh, may seem polynomial uh, with the first term, but it's actually high degree, so it's quite ineffective when n is large. Uh, so in the base case, we have the following complexity. Uh, basically, polynomial in n and just uh, exponential is the size of the S-box. Um, so this is if all S-box are the same. If you have some uh, different S-box, you just uh, uh, get a linear factor k, which translates to m2 times n at the end to m times n2. And in the worst case, which is actually uh, the case with the AES AS X-box, um, you, can't apply, you can't use the improvement by Dinner et al, by Dinner at Eurocrypt, so you have a factor 2 in the exponents on the last term. And in practice, if you look at this uh, for AES parameters, so this leads to only two to the 30 operations to, event, to invert uh, one one function. And if you look at Bike et al proposal, um, so which use uh, twice the block size, it's just 2 to the 35. So I don't have much time remaining, so just quickly, the idea of Bayek et al. was to obfuscate two uh, parallel AES to increase the block size. And may, as they made a security claim of 110 bits. But so again, you need to structure uh, the encoding, so the matrix, uh, the matrix A here. So this matrix has the following form in the top right, so each star is some 8-bit uh, block, 8-bit uh, non-zero block, and otherwise it's all zero. And the idea is basically the same as the direct algorithm, except that now you can use the structure to actually identify exactly um, which uh, encodings uh, were used using some uh, meet-in-the-middle technique. And this allows you uh, allow us to recover the key uh, more efficiently. And so this was implemented. It's quite short, so only 2,000 lines. And basically, the overall, overall complexity is 2 to the 31. It's only 12 seconds times, no, almost no memory. It's available online if you want to take a look at it. And it's basically impossible to fix in a reasonable amount of memory. So um, yeah, I think uh, I will be done. Uh, I just leave this uh, summary slide, which sum up about everything. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Question? No question? No comment? Okay, maybe one question. Um, do you think that there are possible improvement for, for the affine encoding in order to defeat uh, do you think that it's still a good strategy to use a fan encoding to, to implement white box? Um, Is there some, some way out to um, no. adapt them to defeat Hon your Hon attack? Honestly, I, fi I think I find encodings are like not useful. Uh, you will get them if you use some linear non-linear encodings because there is already nothing part. But um, honestly, to get some high complexity with our algorithm, you need to have either a huge uh, S-box, which lead to a huge, uh, some huge tables, or a huge block size, which basically doesn't scale up very, very well. So I think the only way is to either use some 
much bigger nonlinear encodings, but again, the size of the implementation uh, grows up quickly. So yeah, table-based is like mostly dead. <laughs> and some other solution could be polynomial-based like SSA. So the proposal by Berukov uh, should okay. work. But I think the best way to do with white box now would be to focus on finding a new paradigm, actually. Okay. Really finding a new things to do. Okay. So. Thank you. Please thanks the speaker again. And